your lights uh, changing. It's like my what? Your light is changing on your your webcam. Oh, is it? Mm. But now it's back to normal. Back. Yeah, let's like compensating in your face. <laughs> Just play the music. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> just gonna record that, put some echo on it. Yeah, nice. Like, like classic, like Jason movies. <laughs> Always maybe get like, like get, no, but it costs like a trillion rand, but get all of like the, you remember the Cell C voiceover artist that used to be all that like sexy whispering. Cell C. <laughs> or whatever. We get her to be I like, do. the asylum part. You know. <laughs> <laughs> sexily in people's ears maybe you can get more followers you know <laughs> <laughs> even if they just watch the first five seconds just to get that whisper <laughs> yes so dude we're yeah, gonna man. try and make this video on follow breeds that we've kind of held ourselves semi accountable um That's right. who who's going first <laughs> if you want i'll take the <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> okay so I need to do a little bit of um, fancy footwork and, and trickery and sleight of hand with all of our, our viewers and our watchers out there because I think last time I committed and I said to everyone I was going to uh, start reading Sex Criminals you by did. Matt Fraction and Chip Zdarsky. And I'm happy to report I've started. <laughs> I have. I've, you I've should have just said, I didn't. It would have been so much more classic, but anyway. <laughs> I started, but there's a reason why I haven't finished or gotten through the whole first volume, and that's because I actually um, read this first. This is the uh, Legion. It's, it's part of uh, Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning's Legion run, and this is the first volume of that run, and it's called, I think they called it Legion or Future Damned, Future Imperfect, Future of the Damned, um, and I've got to say, dude, I'm, I'm not a Legion fan, Legion of Superheroes at all. For those that don't know the Legion, it's um, a comic that's about a whole bunch of kids and, and teenagers that have super or meta powers, but it's set all the way in the future, like in the year three or 30th century in the future. And uh, the cool thing about the Legion is uh, I think annually or certain periods they hold auditions and they get people to come and you audition, you show off your ability to the Legion and the founding members of the Legion would vote you in. And if you get in, you get a gold Legionnaire's ring. And um, the one ironic thing about the Legion is any, if your superpower is flight, they, they kind of turn their nose up at that because they've discovered in the 30th century the secret to flight. Oh, <laughs> hectic, shame. Yeah, kind of like Superman flight. And when you get your Legionnaire's ring, the minute you put it on, it will grant you the power of flight. So it's the one power they kind of discriminate against. That's just criminal, dude. See what I did there. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> but a, a good friend of ours, Dev, Dev the Collector, Dev the Cartoonist, he's a massive, massive Legion fan, um, and he has been since a little boy, and he turned me on to, he's been hounding me to read the Legion for a while, he turned me on to and said, at least read the Dan Abnett, the, the, the Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning Legion, because it is probably the best stuff, and now I can say I've read a lot of Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning's stuff, they did um, the Annihilation uh, run at Marvel uh, that was involving uh, Annihilus, Thanos, um, uh, Galactus, etc. Uh, there was a, a lead up to Annihilation. There was the actual Annihilation story. They did uh, an Annihilation aftermath whole run. So following that, they also did the relaunch of the Guardians of the Galaxy, the Guardians that you and I know, the Guardians that are in the movies currently. That team and that roster and everything, that was Abnett and Lanning that put uh, that whole storyline together. So I'm a huge fan of, of them when they do cosmic and science fiction stuff. So that's really how Devin got me to read this. 
And I can honestly say, I didn't know much about the Legion, just very high level, but this was a great, easily accessible story. Um, kind of freaky too. The, the villains in this are semi-science fiction, scary science fiction horror, um, but I enjoyed it. Um, very, very cool. The art throughout it does vary at times. Um, different artists doing different things. Um, they're one of my artists that I that I love, a guy named Oliver Koipel. This is actually some of his first artworks for DC, and you would know Oliver Koipel because he paired up with um, Grant Morrison to do All Star Superman. Oh. oh no, I'm lying. I'm like no, that was, that was Frank, Frank Quitely. Quitely, yeah. That was Frank Quitely. Oliver Koipel did a run on Thor. Actually, okay. when they they relaunched Thor. Um, brought Thor and all of the Asgardians down to to Earth, etc. So, very very cool artist. I like a lot of Koipel stuff, but um, surprisingly good read. And that's actually leading me into the next part that I need to, Just to read. Just a quick one, and that is, is that a is that volume one or okay? There's a volume two. Yeah. Okay, so this is volume two, else. and this is apparently, according to all Legion fans, the ultimate Legion story. It's called Legion Lost. Okay. Um, but you do need to read the first volume. The, that kind of sets the stage. Yeah, it gives you context. That, yeah, and it, it, it really, that volume leads into directly into the Legion Lost. Okay. Like literally, the last couple pages of that volume one story leads into this. Um, so, yeah, worth the read. And I must say, I'm actually looking forward to reading part two, the Legion Lost, twelve part uh, story there. So, once I've done that, I will give you a review and, and my thoughts on that. And I am. Still committed to finishing <laughs> Sex Criminals by Matt Fraction and Chip Zdarsky. So cool. I've got a lot of work to do over the next weekend or so. And on that note, what I also managed to, to pick up and give a reread again and thought I'd, I'd listed as a recommended reading for all our, our fans out there is this, Hulk the End. Uh, this particular one that I've got here is collected in hardcover. Uh, written by Peter David and art by Dale Keown. In my opinion, Dale Keown is one of the best Hulk artists. He's just, and in this, his art is stupendous. I mean, really, really cool artwork. Nice. Dale Keown does some of the best, most hardcore Hulks. I mean, take a look at that splash page over there. Of oh, the maestro. <laughs> um, so for those that don't know, um, this particular storyline, uh, the big, the first part of it is, it was a Hulk story called Future Imperfect, and that is basically um, this, this, these people go back in time and they get our current day Hulk, and they bring him into the future because there's a version of the Hulk called the Maestro. He's older, he's stronger, and he's literally taken over the world, and he rules the world with like an iron fist. So they've gone into the past to grab current Hulk to help them best or, or overthrow the maestro and, and kind of set the future or put the future back to a semblance of normalcy. Mm. Um, and then the next part of the story, the second or half of it is um, this story here, um, the actual Hulk, the end story. And it's set in way, way, way in the future, literally, the Earth is completely, practically destroyed. All the Avengers are gone. People are gone. Hulk is the last living person on the planet. And the story goes through there. And it's it's quite a tragic and sad story. I won't give it too much away. But definitely something just, you know, the, the future imperfect storyline is great. It's one of my favorite Hulk stories. But this, the end story, is whew, it, it tugs on the heartstrings. And it, it, nice. you put the book down going, Wow, that's that's quite heavy. So I saw it on the bookshelf. I just grabbed it quickly to to page through the art, really, and I just ended up rereading it again. And definitely worth uh, worth the read. So if those can find it online or get a copy shipped to them during these isolation and lockdown periods, I highly recommend that. Great story, nice. easy to read. Hmm. Cool. So that's that's me in a nutshell, okay. dude. Do you, what did uh, so, you have unlike you, so this is the book I talked about last time um, that I was going to try to read. It's Black Canary and Zatanna by Paul mm -hmm. Dini. Um, I did read it. 
<laughs> no, that was um, good. Well done. Yeah, and so, what were your thoughts? So, I, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to just say like, yeah, I just loved it, but um, I don't think it would be constructive um, in terms of the video. So I'm trying to think where I should start. Like, well, The question know, I would ask first and foremost is, did you love it? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, so I did enjoy it, um, but I do, maybe let me get the cons out the way. Um, and then yeah. I'll, um, so, well, not really cons, but anyway, let's wing it. So as far as I know, this is, I can't remember when this was released. It's quite an old book. Um, so for anyone who wants to get it, they can get it on Amazon or anything similar, because it's a, it's an actual graphic novel. You know, it's, it's got an ISBN number and all of that. Yeah. Um, again, the title is Blood Spell. Um, and... It's pre-New 52 continuity as far as I know, but it is its own little self-contained story. Um, so I might as well, it's worth mentioning that it, it's you can read in one sitting, so it's a very easy read, which I, you know, I love finding books like that because whether it's in your lunch break or whether it's just before you go to bed in the evening, you know, you, you can commit to just like that hour and, and you knock a story out and you learn a little bit more. So yeah. what I didn't love is the art. Um, okay. It's, I find that that's, for me, that's one of the the, the interesting or it, it's the gamble that you get with comic books as a medium because you can have a good writer. I think Paul Dean is a very good writer. Um, and, yeah, art is always subjective. It's always preferential to di different people. So you probably find some people have, have read the exact same story and, and potentially gravitated towards the art. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, maybe they, they enjoyed the art and not so much the storytelling in, yeah. in how Paul so, Dini tells the story. So. Yeah, so, and I'm going to, let me just dive in a bit. So, like, I found, it's it's tricky, man. Um, and I guess this is, the more I read comics, the better I'll be able to explain this. But I found the flow and the paneling and, and the splashes and everything really cool. And some of the chase scenes were awesome. But the actual mm. character characters, like, I'm going to try to find one quickly for you. Um like I found Satana's face very weird and long. Um, let me just I'm covering Ben, but yeah. So and Warren, I don't know if you can see, dude. Yeah, um, yeah. So and and then like and then like Black Canary's like facial expressions sometimes just like didn't like come alive, you know, like like according okay. to the script and stuff. Um, and then there is one other thing. It's there's a there's a vague scene. It's not big where. Because it's Black Canary, you know, she's hanging out with um, Oliver Queen, you know, a.k.a. Mm. The Arrow. And I just found him so Peter Pan looking. And I get it. I know there is an element of him that will always look like that. Um, right. But he just looked too cartoony for me. And I think, like, the TV show ruined it for me because, like, Oliver Queen is hardcore now. And unfortunately, uh, you know, like, okay. Green Lantern and... So what am I saying? Green Arrow and Aquaman have suffered from that through the comics. And back in the day, you know, everyone sees them as, like, these, like, inferior characters because they just aren't cool. And they've gotten cooler over time. Um, you know? Yeah, again, I think it depends who's doing them. So if you look back in, in history to sort of the, the Danny O'Neill, um, Neil Adams era, when he was doing Green Lantern and Green Arrow, uh, Neil Adams is a fantastic, amazing artist. He, he, he changed the game art-wise when, when he started doing stuff for, for DC, on, both on Batman yeah, and on Batman, that series. Yeah. Um, and he was foreseen as a, as a renegade, and he did Green Arrow quite hardcore. Mm. Um, in that storyline, Green Lantern was the goody-goody space cop doing uh, good things, etc. And Green Arrow was the hardcore, down in the streets, ragged, tough kind of, of hero too. Almost the, the direct antithesis to the Green Lantern in that story. Um, also, there was a three-part story I've read of the Green, Land, uh, Green Arrow called The Longbow Hunters. That was done 70s or 80s. And there, also a great portrayal of, of Oliver Queen as kind of the, the nonchalant Bruce Wayne playboy at times. Mm. But when he needed to, man, uh, he has to hunt down um, someone who's been kidnapped. And he has to literally track and hunt and get information to find this person and dude, some of the means that he takes to yeah. get information out of people, very hardcore on that. So, and even there, even though he looked Peter Panny or Robin Hoodie with the costume, not Robin Hood because hard and, and, yeah. and aggressive in that story. So yeah, maybe it just, the interpretation here was, was off for you. And, yeah. and again, going back to what you say, you, 
you like your tough, rugged Steve Amell yeah, Green Lantern. Yeah, exactly. Uh, green and, and then that sort of goes into my next point is, and it's going to sound like a contradiction, but um, yeah. I didn't find the story was the strongest story ever. But yeah. what I mean by that is exactly just what you talked about, the Hulk, you know, um, the end, you know, where you left with your heartstrings pulled and it's it's really hardcore. But this didn't have that, but also it didn't need to. It was a, v- a story that was very much don't take itself seriously. There's one or two beats that were serious and they need to be and it, 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 it flowed through. But generally it was supposed to be a very fun story. So that is both a pro and a con. Like I didn't leave there going, my life has changed and the way I think, you know, is changed forever, you know, because it's meant to be this fun story. Um, yeah. So talking about other things that like I did like, like the banter, and this is now the script, obviously, Paul Dini, between um, Black Canary and Zatanna is so cool. Like, um, you know, you've got like Black Canary, it's this hard ass, speaks to her mind, you know, like, you know, doesn't shut up and Zatanna's still getting there. She throws in a trip here and there, but she's more quiet and reserved. And, yeah. and they play with each other really well um, as, as good friends. There isn't even the struggle to work together. I'll, I'll explain a bit about that now. Um, but there's also one thing I found really interesting, dude, is, and this might be due to lack of my knowledge. It's very possible. But every iteration I've seen of Zatanna, if you, if you look around, you'll see there is... In Young Justice, she comes in, you know, in the animation I'm talking about now. Um, mm. She's the young, innocent kid that's, you know, her dad's overprotective and she's kind of like young and naive. And then you go, you flip all the way to like comics where you see things like Damned and stuff and she's fully, this fully formed witch and you see nothing in between, very rarely. Mm. And what this story does is very vaguely takes you through her like coming of age, maybe coming of age is a bit too hardcore, but you see her elements of like the first day she was in the um you know the hall of justice and there's these yeah. little beats and it ties into the story um okay that's quite nice though those, which, those little yeah bits. yeah which i really liked about that and um yeah so so more about this there's one other thing before i get into the, a little bit of the story which i really appreciated so maybe i'll just tie it all together so essentially the the, the gist of the story is um black canary is doing an undercover op kind of thing for for the, the league um, it's, mm. a, it's a small time gig. It's not, nothing like world ending, but there's a group of um, ladies that want to do a heist in, in Vegas. Um, and that's what I'm going to get to now. Um, and in like in the part of the scene, like she, the, the main leader of the, the thing that's getting all the criminals together now, because obviously Black Canary is undercover. Um, yeah. She makes them all cut their hands and do a blood oath, you know, like as a sisterhood. And okay. Black Canary being who she is, and she's like, okay, um, weirdo whatever, let me do it. Um, and then the whole thing goes sideways. They bust the, the operation, but the, 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 the main villain gets away. And time goes by and all these people that were part of it start losing their minds and start dying. And, and even she starts feeling a bit weird. So she goes to her one and only friend, Zatanna, which understands it. And, and she very quickly explains to her that it was a blood spell tying her soul to all of them that she could carry on living. So it was a lot more hectic. And then the whole sure. story unfolds of Satana helping her solve this. Okay. Um, and and undo the, the magic. Yeah. And, okay. and that's the story in a nutshell. Um, but what it's, it's, it's a small thing, but like, I just have to mention it is, which is really cool. Anyone that stays in the States, this will be such a small deal. But for me, it was, so I mentioned that the, the heist takes place in Vegas. Um, sure. and there's this whole like chase scene throughout the whole, um, like a few of the pages. And what they do is, I don't know if it's a rights issue, but they go through all these iconic places on the strip and they rename them, you know, like, but you can clearly see like it was Circus Circus and um, Emperor's Palace and um, they even bash through the windows of the stratosphere. And you know this, um, obviously the audience don't. Um, late last year, I got to go to Vegas with my my parents and I got with Kira and we just got to spend like a week there. Um, yeah. So just going, I was right there, I was right there, I was right there and like pointing out all these places um, it's amazing it, what a difference it can make to to your connection to the story. Yeah, exactly. It, de- it definitely gave me an extra tie to the story, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, and the last thing I'll mention about it, because I know I've been talking a bit, um, I did make one or two Hardly. notes here. But um, yeah, is that one extra cool thing about it is that because it's a self-contained graphic novel, um, they don't do this with a lot of them, but some of them they do. In the back, it's actually got all the, like a lot of the, the script and, and the oh, sketches nice. and stuff. Um so, I mean, I actually was going to ask you if someone like Dev would want to lend this from me because, um, you know, you can actually, like, 
it dissects it and everything on how you can draw her. Like, you know, if, if you know how to draw, you can, you know, it's got, you know, how you halve the body and split it up into sure, portions sure. and, and there's script notes and stuff. So I, th that's always really cool. I even might, even though I don't love the art, but I still might give a bash and drawing the Satana just for the fun of it, you know, um, like step that, by step. I really appreciate when, when you get that extra content. I mean, I think it, it, it speaks to our generation of, kids that were coming out of um, video cassette rentals into DVD or Blu-ray rentals, um, moving from cassette tapes to, to CDs, etc. You'd often get a booklet with your CD or a booklet or, yeah, or extra the scenes in. behind the scenes on the DVD itself, DVD commentary coming from actors or the director, etc. And when they bring that into the graphic novel world, not only do you get the story, but you get, like you say, snippets of the the script notes that, that, that Paul Neely did or sketch art leading into the story, how the artist was coming up with the look, the feel for, mm. for the characters and stuff in the story. I I love that. And like you say, people that are interested in, in comics, people that want to try and break into comics, want to start drawing, writing, whatever, those are, they're invaluable mm. to, to, to getting you in there and wrapping your head around it. And, Back in the 80s, 90s, when I started getting into comic collecting, you didn't get that. You didn't get all that extra stuff. That that, that you, All you got was your comics on the shelf. You'd buy them, you'd read them, put them in a box, and that was it. And then I think that's one of the cool pros that the, the collected editions, the graphic novels have over just single comics, for my liking, or my take anyway. Yeah, so and, and I'm gonna like change things up a bit and break our little rules. But so I don't okay. have if I wanted to give recommend reading, I would recommend this book, especially for fun, like just a, a chilled, fun, self-contained story and easy read. Um, nice. I would definitely recommend it. But for me to commit to reading, I'm gonna ask you what I should do. I've got two here, so the mm. one is easy to gravitate towards. I do want to give us some context. I bought this TP ages ago and then people told me, well, there's actually more the internet that said that this was a lot weaker of a story. And I did this yeah. thing where instead of having my own opinion, I just listened to everyone. So I want to, I want to, I want to consider reading it again. Uh, well, reading it. So it's, it's a Constantine. This was pre new 52. It's called mm. volume one going down. So it's that, which is the easy one. Or I have the omnibus of seven soldiers, which is still, <laughs> not even open it's still in its plastic um and anyone who needs some context warren might be able to give better context but this is grant morrison and i think it's four issues um that's on specific different characters and zatanna is one of them surprise surprise and, uh, mark and they all into tie if i'm if i'm not mistaken yeah um so yeah i don't know what to a part of me wants to just go in and try and read this like bible sized omnibus but um and then yeah so 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 what do you rate i should read well, the problem with the omnibus is is it's it's the old encompassing entire whole story that grant morris envisioned i'm at if memory serves me i'm pretty sure it's broken down uh per character etc and they are interlinks and intertie-ins um you know if you were going to t take on the omnibus i'd say pick a character and read that character's story or at least one character if you get to more awesome um but yeah part of me is curious to to hear your take on it like i i'm almost wanting to suggest that you either read the zatana portion because you gravitate yeah. to i think dr fate's in that as well potentially reading the fate portion and, and going was it enough to to hook you or are you you engaged enough to read the rest of the seven soldiers uh there's a part of me that's curious to see if that grabs you if morrison mm -hmm. does hook you um i'd also like to see what what your take is on how morrison interprets satana because he's a very he's got a lot of a magic behind him he, he's yeah. a, i think he's a practicing magician so I'd, I'd be keen to see how he writes a magical character i do think that there might be a smart thing as from your suggestion is read um and if i'm not mistaken zatanna might be issue one but that's a guess it's a total spin so um well first volume i mean so um mm -hmm. so yeah and and if i like it enough it might intrigue me to read the rest which 
I can maybe episode by episode report back on characters or something like that. Um, but yeah, so, so, uh, so that would be me. I would challenge you okay. on the Seven Soldiers. I'd like to see challenge what accepted. you think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 